we've already got about 17 folks in the room with us, which is a fantastic number. Okie dokie. So it is four o'clock and we know that we have an incredible amount of fantastic content and ground to cover. Um, so we'll go ahead and just get rolling with a little bit of our housekeeping. Um, thank you so much for everyone joining us today and those of you that are joining us on Facebook on behalf of the Southeastern School Behavioral Health Community as well as the Behavioral Alliance of South Carolina. We want to say thank you for joining us today. Um, we are thrilled to have Dr. Joni Splett with us discussing a very critical topic area for all of us um, being universal screening and implementation. Um, as an aside, if you have questions, you can certainly populate those in the chat box. If you'd like to ask something anonymously, um, you're more than welcome to use the Q&A and we will field those to Dr. Splett throughout our presentation. We do have a pre-survey and post-survey poll that we are hoping that you all will join us in. Just three questions, super short and sweet, um, but we certainly appreciate being able to have your valued feedback. Um, for those of you on Facebook, if you have questions, um, please go ahead and put those in the comment box and I will make sure to get them to Dr. Splett throughout the presentation. Um, so without further ado and in respect of time, I'm going to go ahead and share our first pre-survey poll with you all. And while doing that, we'll go ahead and say thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Splett. We're really grateful to have you. And I'll go ahead and let you start sharing your screen. And if you want to share with folks a little bit about who you are and how you're joining us today. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so I'm so excited um, to be joining um, and be a part of you guys' community again. I say again because um, I feel like I was kind of at the the like pre, you know, I feel like a founding mother, I guess, um, and the school behavioral health community back when we were the South Carolina um, school behavioral health community and we were meeting in Columbia. And then I think in our second year we met in Charleston um, and now with um, with Mark's vision and June Greenlaw's um, amazing work and now Taylor's taking it over and I don't even know how many hands it's gone through at this point um, but I know that you have an amazing conference in Myrtle Beach coming up and have added these these webinars. Um, I am excited to be to be here and to be um, part of of your community again um, and be sharing some of that content. So after I was in South Carolina I was there um, training with Shirley Vickery and Sandy Manning and Richland Two School District and then with Mark at the um, we used at the University of South Carolina then I um, was able to get a faculty position at the University of Florida um, and so I've been here this is my sixth year I guess here um, and yeah so just kind of um, continuing that same work in Florida which um, is only slightly warmer. I was just telling Taylor that we can run outside all year long here. <laughs> so just slightly warmer, um, but very much the same. Are we ready to go, Taylor? Or do you? Absolutely. You got, it looks, okay. looks I wasn't so sure good. how that uh, pre-workshop pre, uh, <laughs> poll works, sorry. Um, We've already populated their answers, it looks like, and we've got a curiosity about being able to have access to the webinar uh, following today's presentation, all of our resources will be available on uh, the Behavioral Alliance of South Carolina website. Um, and I will put that into our uh, chat box so that you all can access that. Um, and of course, um, any additional resources that Dr. Split provides today, we'd be happy to share um, with the group. So um, I hope that uh, that everybody enjoys. Thank you so much, Dr. Split. Awesome. And um, Taylor and I had talked earlier that if you have questions as we go, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A um, and she'll watch that and, and interrupt me at any time. I was telling her I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old, so I'm used to being interrupted at any moment um, and definitely want those questions when, when they're on your mind and so address them at that point. But I do want to get to know you a little bit, um, have a back and forth as much as we can with how many people are on here. So if you have a second in the chat to put um, your role 
you know, like what role you have in your district or in your school or in your community or in your family's life that's kind of brings you to be interested in this topic. And if you are with the school or district, also add in there um, how your district is identifying students who need more than tier one mental health supports. How, um, how, what are they using and or what's the process that they're already um, using for that? So if you can go ahead and put that in the chat for a second, I'll pause and get a sense of it just to kind of see where people are at. Great, so some of the friends from the um, South Carolina Department of Mental Health. I worked with, with y'all when I was there as well. I think uh, Louise Anderson, I think she's retired since I was there, but um, also some friends, oh, some friends from academia, some friends from private companies, all right. All right, so I'll continue to watch that as we go and just to see, um, it helps me kind of tailor information and get us um, so that I know um, where people are coming at kind of different contexts and different levels to this information. Um, so I'll continue to watch that as we go. Um, but so I wanted to get um, everybody on the same page with when I talk about, um, we're gonna talk about how to make universal screening work in your school. And so I think it's first important to identify what screening is. And I know that um, back, I think in August, Dr. Kathleen Lane did a webinar on, um, on multi-tiered frameworks and screening in the COVID-19 era. Um, I I've watched that and been part of that. And so I'm hoping this kind of provides a little bit of a, um, next steps of like procedures. So you're aware of it, you kind of see how it sits in this framework, like how procedurally, what are the, some of the procedures and the planning and the protocol you need to have in place to even think about actually implementing and adopting. Um, and so universal screening specifically, the way I define it is that it identifies risk early systematically and for an entire population. So early, um, is similar to what we do with a thermometer when we're um, detecting illness in kids, especially in this COVID-19 era. Um, many schools, my son's school is still doing this, is taking their temperature before they can go into the building. Um, I'm not sure the science isn't really panning out to show it to be a really psychometrically um, predict, have a lot of predictive validity for COVID-19, especially in kids, but we're still doing it. Um, and the idea behind it is that it detects risk early that um, um, before he's in the building and transmitting the disease to others, we detect it early um, and can screen for that. It's also the screening I'm talking about is also systematic. So it's done um, systematically, maybe like how we plan it so that there's a process and there's no holes and no gaps in that process that kids aren't falling through the crack the um, cracks in our process. And that's kind of like back when we used to go to the airport um, and hopefully TSA uh, doesn't always happen this way, but TSA is supposed to have such a systematic process that, you know, weapons can't get through, things that hurt us can't get through that system. Um, we fly out of Orlando often here. And when you get there, it looks um, to TSA, it looks like you are never going to get through that line. It's just like Mickey Mouse ears galore and families everywhere. Um, it's huge. And then suddenly you're through it because they have a systematic process that they implement the same way every time. And it gets you through that process. It's also for an entire population. So I have the school up here now. But we're not talking about targeted screening here. We're not saying like the teacher sent a referral in and I'm gonna do some like screening, targeted screening assessments for depression um, or suicidality, self-harm. Um, we're talking about screening an entire grade level, an entire school building, um, an entire district. So the, however we've defined the population, we're doing that whole population, whether we have an indicator of risk or not they're all getting that same screener. 
Um, so this is really akin to what you see with how we do hearing screenings, vision screenings, dental screenings, head lice screenings. This year we're doing COVID screenings. Um, but you can see in those screenings, we've done those in many other areas. So why not mental health as well? Because we have some validated tools that could be used. Um, I think in defining what is screening, I've done that. I also wanna define what is not screening. Um, so nomination procedures where they nominate the 10 with the most kind of um, externalizing behaviors and 10 most internalizing behaviors. Um, it can, it's a process and you can use it, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, referral forms um, or just reviewing existing data. So in positive behavioral interventions and supports, there's a constant review of discipline data. Um, and that's a great indicator. It's a good start. It's a process you can use, but it is not, um, it is not population wide. And it's also not necessarily early and it's not mental health specific. So it's um, thus not an example <laughs> of, what, um, of what I'm talking about. Um, it also creates inequities because um, we know that discipline referrals are often somewhat biased. It's a kid that's disrupting the classroom. Um, oftentimes, maybe a student of color um, being more likely to get that referral. Um, so it just exacerbates those inequities and thus it's not kind of that systematic uh, early detection. Um, in Florida, we have the early warning system and that's incredibly common in all of our school districts that they use early warning system data. It's just an algorithm of attendance and discipline and suspension and academic data. And it's very good at um, predicting school dropout. So in middle school, some of those, that algorithm is very good at predicting um, dropping out by junior and senior year. Um, but that isn't um, totally related to mental health and mental health needs. Um, oftentimes it's also called like bright bites or performance matters, others districts call it that. Um, and so again, it's just not a robust indicator of social, emotional, and behavioral health, especially at an elementary school level, but even still at not at um, middle or high school. We all know kids um, and students who are struggling with anxiety or depression who are still doing okay in school. And thus those early warning system, that academic data is going to look fine. It's not going to detect their mental health needs. Um, and the thing is, we do have we do have measures and we do have indicators of mental health, and so um, why not use those? Um, so some of those I put on the screen here, um, and there's a range of them here. There's a lot of them available. All the ones on the screen here are technically adequate. Um, on our ones, I would support you exploring and considering to use. I'm not going to go in today into a lot of um, a lot of detail on instrument selection. Um, I can point you to some resources um, for that. Um, I think that that's kind of another topic and another webinar. It's the most common question I get, um, and so I know that it's on your mind. But to me, um, the question that should first to be asked is like, what's our purpose and objective for screening and what protocols and resources are we going to put in place to make sure we screen ethically? Um, and then you can start going through these instruments to find ones that meet that those purpose and objectives in your protocol. There's many available, so you're likely to find one that will. Um, but first you need to set that up. And I tell my students this all the time. I just tell them to avoid, um, to avoid the vendor area at the co conferences. And I shouldn't say that <laughs> on this webinar, given you have a conference coming up. But um, before you go walk down that vendor aisle, know your purpose, know your objectives, like what you're wanting your district or your school and your um, mental health team is wanting to do. Um, and the, and only talk to ones that, that fit that. Um, otherwise you end up with, you know, alphabet soup of random things you've implemented and random stuff you've adopted and it's not meeting your purpose and the, the objective um, that, that your school's really set out to identify. Um, and so these are some of the ones I commonly see school districts here in Florida, some in, Char some in South Carolina, I still work with like Charleston and across the nation. Um, 
that have been they have adopted. Oftentimes, a major concern is um, what they cost. And so there is one on here, um, I guess two, that is still completely free, um, that you can get like paid versions of them. And some of the TA and consulting to use them is not free. <laughs> but I also kind of um, always give this little disclaimer, I guess, is that sometimes people are like, the best things in life are free, but really, when it comes to screening, you get what you pay for. Um, and I, I believe that about my hair, right? So my husband, he can go to sports clubs. I have no problem with that. That's great. I don't spend exorbitant amounts on my hair, but I do think that when it comes to my hair, I get what I pay for. I, I don't have tattoos, um, but I think that this image portrays my point exactly is, you know, if you're going to put something on your body or you're going to give it to your kids and they students and teachers that you care so much about, um, it might not be free. Um, and, and you might want to find, the, it might be worth funding to figure that out. And I often, the examples I give are that um, if you adopt a free screener, it's going to take personnel resources in your IT department to figure out how to get, you know, every student roster loaded onto that and distributed to your teachers and then take time um, in your school building to administer and collect the data. I had a student when I first got here to UF that did paper copy teacher report screeners and it took her two weeks to enter the entire middle school's data. And so it's just not um, readily accessible. You've lost the momentum because you're not able to use it right away, right? And it took those personnel resources, whereas if they would have paid for some company uh, to do it, it would have taken a little bit of time to get the technology to talk to each other so that you can get like your student information system to talk to the um, software of the screening company. And then they'll just like batch upload every few nights the student rosters, right? And then your results are immediately available. And so you're either going to pay for screening by FTE or you're gonna pay for it um, in the technology part. And I just put that out there because I think um, if it's important, if something's important, then um, we're willing to put money towards it. And so I think that um, if, if it's important and you think it's something you need to do, then I encourage you to find some funding to do that. And lots of school districts have done that. And so if you're interested in how, I can happy to share um, where they found that funding or where they pulled from to do it. Um, but it is an important consideration. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today next is pulled from um, a resource that I was incredibly fortunate to be a member of, um, some very great, um, very, um, very wise people <laughs> that kind of put all their heads together and their experiences together of supporting districts and launching screening. Um, we put our heads together and developed this implementation guide. Um, it's linked there. I can share it with Taylor maybe later. Um, um, but we have three sections to it. We first have an ethical and legal considerations, then a procedural planning section, and it ends with instrument selection. And so I would strongly encourage you if like you want more detail than what I have today, that you go uh, find that resource and download it. It's free and it can it has worksheets and planning guides and can really walk you through um, a lot of what I have to talk about today. So I'm going to spend most of today um, talking through some most of the procedural planning section. Um, I think that Dr. Lane gave a really good big picture view of like how screening fits into a multi-tiered framework and what the outcomes can be if you implement screening. So really convincing about why you want to do it. So if you still need convincing of that, <laughs> I encourage you to go to the um, School Behavioral Health YouTube channel. Um, when I looked for it the other day, it was right at the very top of the videos um, page. And so you can watch that webinar there and, and um, find out more resources about it. Um, so today I'm really going to talk more about the procedure. So in order to think about um, um, where, um, where in screening you guys are and how these procedures I can talk about fitting into it, I was hoping maybe in the chat box you could add the number that best fits your situation. So at what stage is your district considering the universal screening implementation? Are you number one 
we were doing it pre-COVID even. So you've been doing screening already, you would put number one. Number two, you're making plans right now to launch it next year. Number three, you're talking about the need to do it in your district or community, but you don't have any specific plans yet. Number four, you're aware of screening, but you really haven't considered implementing it yet. Maybe you've gone to some conference presentations on it, or you've seen some readings or gotten some resources and looked at them, but um, nobody is really considered in your district or community implementing it. Or number five, you don't know what universal screening is. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and I need to back up a lot. <laughs> so if you can put one, two, three, four, or five in the chat, it'll give me a sense of kind of where everybody is. I love how much feedback everyone is providing today, Dr. <laughs> it's fantastic to be able to see, yeah. what see where people it. are. So it yeah. says the whole state is wanting a main screener for us to use. What state is that? Do you mind, Megan Weaver? Is that South Carolina or Alabama? Oh. One, one for academics. Yes, that's common. Most, um, most, I hope most districts have um, a screener happening for academics. Academic only. All right. Okay. Well, thank you guys for adding and keep. If you haven't yet, feel free to keep adding in there. Um, what you wanna, what, where you guys are. It gives me a sense. It's good to see that there are. I wasn't really sure like where people would be. Um, Charleston County had adopted it when I left and I still continue to do some work with them in different capacities. And I just wasn't sure where everybody else in the area was. Um, so I wanna talk about procedural planning today and I'll try to kind of think about um, our range here as we go. Um, and the reason I wanna talk about, I, I really like talking about procedural planning as I think that um, we can um, implement Apparently, I have these on a timer. Um, we can implement screening, um, but unless we implement it well, um, it's not going to have the outcomes we want. And in fact, if it's not implemented well, it might actually have some negative or itrogenic effects um, and not, you know, and not just be like a neutral event, but have some negative effects on our children, children and youth in our schools. And so I think it's really, really the procedures will both just which it is implemented are critically important. Um, you don't want this situation, right? <laughs> um, and so in the implementation guide, um, we these are the kind of the sections of the ethical legal considerations chapter and of the procedural planning chapter. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little tiny bit on ethical and considerations right now. If you want more information, I'm happy to provide that later. I'll put my email at the end, um, but there's some examples of informed consent in the implementation guide. Um, we generally suggest um, working with your school board attorneys on this topic um, and pushing for some sort of opt out or passive consent. In fact, Charleston County um, had a great system when I was there of um, they always had a letter at the beginning of the school year that went home about their academic screening and MTSS, their multi-tiered model. And so they just revised that letter to be inclusive of academic behavior, social, emotional well-being, um, and, and use that same process. And I always use that as, as an example because I think um, it really destigmatizes the issue, right? It still gives an opt-out um, process or opportunity um, to do that to for parents to opt out, but it basically says like you shouldn't be worried about this, but you can opt out. And I work. I sometimes I see districts 
put a new, make a whole different letter or make it a whole separate thing. Um, like see, I have one district right now that's made the mental health screening its very own team. And I, I just worry that that level of elevation just further stigmatizes the issue and kind of sends the message to others that like we should be concerned about this or worried about what they're doing with our kids rather than it just being kind of like, this is the way we work in this district and we care about all of these components of your child's life and we're gonna attend to that. Um, and I see in the chat, um, the letter is actually an appendix in the implementation guide, I believe. So not that I think you should download the implementation guide, but I think you should download the implementation guide and it, um, maybe I can figure out how to put it in the chat box or I don't know, Taylor, if you can download it and put it in there too. But that was I did go ahead and add the link and we've got a bunch of requests for those resources. So just for everyone to know, we will make the resources available on our website. And if you would like to have me send anything to you directly, we would be super happy to do so. Um, our web, um, I will make our email address available to all of y'all and you can just reach out directly. Perfect. And my email is at the end. Um, so, and I can put it in the chat too, but um, so there's a thing on consent, um, fair, valid, useful instruments. If you read the instrument selection section or use any on the slide that I just put up, they're, they're all fair, valid, and useful in my opinion. And in the psychometric literature, data collection and storage, um, we'll talk a little bit about this. I'm, I have a bunch of slides on procedure. I'm just running quickly through ethical and legal considerations because the most of today's webinar is supposed to talk, um, emphasize the procedural side. Data collection and storage is an important ethical consideration because of FERPA. Um, and so it's another thing that um, you get what you pay for. If you, the systems that you pay for um, are really um, good about where you can set levels of access. So you can set the teacher, classroom teacher's access to only see his or her classroom, um, but the administrator's access to see the whole school building or the school counselor's access to see the whole school building, right? Or the district administrator's access to see the whole district. Um, so you already have FERPA embedded, whereas if you adopted a free one, then you've got to um, set those systems up yourself. Somebody has to in your district. Um, knowing the limits of the screening data and kind of setting that ahead of time, it's only one data point. Just because it screens high, it doesn't mean there's a mental health concern. It means that another investigate, like more information needs to be sought and it needs to be considered. Um, and, and then ensuring that you have the capacity to act. So the capacity to act is really um, kind of where we're gonna launch into today um, because ethically, if you screen, you have to have a plan to intervene, right? You have to make sure that you have a protocol for using those data acting on those data and making sure you have the resources to provide students who are identified. Um, and I know that's where a lot of people get really concerned and nervous um, and get stressed out about this idea that um, we would, you know, screen every student in the class in the school and that's going to just overwhelm the already limited and stretched resources we have, which I completely agree. Like, understand and empathize of where you're coming from. But it also doesn't mean that those needs don't exist. So taking that approach is almost just like burying your head in the sand. Um, it's basically saying like, we're just not gonna identify those needs and like kind of pretend that they don't exist. They're still going to exist even if you don't scream, right? And so I think the better response and more ethical responsible response is we've got to build capacity. To, identify, to do screening so that we, we make sure we identify needs early system and systematically, right? And we build capacity to be able to respond to that. So how do you build capacity? Well, you set up systems and procedures in your school and your district to make sure that the data um, are used immediately and the resources are available for those students. Um, so you take time to plan, you make sure you understand the needs so that you can map resources to be ready to respond to the needs when you do screen. Um, you establish procedures and a protocol for using them and you plan for training and ongoing support. Um, and so we're gonna kind of walk through those steps next. So first, identifying your screening objectives and outcomes, determining your population, informants, timing, and frequency. So, 
um, you might consider first what your objective of screening is. So you could, um, most of the time when we people say they're gonna screen, their primary purpose is all the way over there on the right is identifying intensive needs for individualized services. Like they wanna identify students in need of intervention um, and for inter you know those strategies I asked about earlier of like um, identifying the students who are tier one isn't um, enough for them. And oftentimes they're saying like, there's some group of students that teacher referrals or parent referrals. I saw some of those examples in the chat um, that there's some group of students um, that that's not working for. Um, and I'll be honest, um, it was like my internship and postdoc that really this kind of came to light for me because I sat in those problem solving team meetings and we weren't doing any screening, but it was totally reliant on a teacher referring to that team. And for a teacher to refer to that team, she, she or he had to be willing to fill out all of the paperwork that came along with it, take time to meet with a psychologist or behavior um, specialist, um, to do some like pre-referral consultation observations, come to the team meeting to talk through um, what was happening and provide some interventions. Those team meetings often went way too long and were not very um, functional <laughs> and enjoyable to be in. Um, and then deal with like the interventions, the low intensity supports or whatever interventions would follow. And I just came to the strong belief that um, it was very discouraging to, to refer a student, that they had to be having major problems. If I were a teacher, they would have had to be having major problems for me to take it to that problem solving team, because it was going to mean a whole lot more work for me in the long run without a lot of promise of um, things getting better. And so I strongly believe that we're missing students and the data show that we're missing students because we're relying on that referral process and the teacher um, you know, that scale tipping enough for the teacher to come to the problem solving team meeting. Um, so the objective is most often to identify those intensive needs that we're missing. Um, but it's also important to remember that you can use your screening data in other ways. So oftentimes I have districts that adopt it. Um, I've had a few do this recently. They adopted it and said from the get go for the first two years, they were just going to screen in the fall and spring for population surveillance. Their objective was monitoring the population um, and their tier one effectiveness. And they use that also then to, um, in their second year, to think about what programming and supports they need. Like here's kind of the general pervasiveness of needs that we're seeing in our district and in these schools. Um, and so here's the supports that they're gonna need to, um, for us to be able to start screening at, for an individual and intensive need purpose, right? So there's a range of objectives you can identify um, and you can use those to layer on each other um, to increasingly make sure that you have that once you do screen for intervention needs, you have capacity to respond to that because you've already um, identified what the general need of your district and schools might be. Um, another thing you have to consider when um, you're developing those procedures is what do you want to screen for? Um, what area? So we talk a lot about externalizing and internalizing behaviors. Um, so externalizing is like disruptive, impulsivity, antisocial behaviors, right? Internalizing more of the like depression, anxiety, um, withdrawn kind of symptoms. Um, but there's also like academic readiness and enabling skills. So academic enablers, there's um, uh, the ACEs measure that you can use for that. You can screen for academic enabling skills. And sometimes districts find those a better fit for um, their community because it, it more closely ties to their academic mission. Um, and they have intervention supports for that. Some districts that have, like in South Carolina, with the mental health supports that you have, you um, might really be interested more in identifying the students you're missing that are experiencing internalizing symptoms. Um, social skills are a common one that, um, you know, the district and the community are really finding that they need to do a better job of developing their students' social skills to prepare, have that um, ultimate career readiness. And, and um, citizenship participation. And so they screen for social skills. Um, there are pro-social measures that screen for like mental health wellness. 
um, and, and some that do both. And so that provides the opportunity to kind of like plan um, to, to boost strengths of students um, while also meeting intervention needs. So there's a range of different um, domains or um, outcomes that you can screen for, um, but you've got to have those conversations with your stakeholders and your community and your district in your schools um, to make sure that you outline them from the get-go. Um, one thing I do want to throw in is I often um, and increasingly in years have seen people uh, and districts that ask about screening for trauma. That's another domain that um, seems to be um, hot, a hot kind of sexy topic right now um, and has been for a few years. Um, and I'm just very hesitant to screen for trauma and would caution you against it very, very strongly. And my rationale is because when trauma happens, um, there's a it, it doesn't happen in this linear fashion, right? Like a traumatic event happens. It's not like some people, you know, continue with average and some people drop immediately. It's more often like this. Um, and so detecting those students who um, who continue down that like downward spiral trajectory, we can do that with our other mental health screeners, right? And we can do that with referral, um, but screening for trauma specifically doesn't tell us how that person's going to respond. It doesn't tell us if they need intervention immediately or not. Um, and in many ways it can create, it can exacerbate a lot of inequities and exacerbate um, structural systems of racism and stigmatizing. We know that um, our communities of color and our lower resource communities, there's more pervasive experiences of, of trauma and chronic trauma and complex trauma. And thus um, we're going to, you know, we're going to just over stigmatize that situation without offering um, the help that we're going to be able to offer doesn't really match the need. We're not going to be able to provide an intervention that resolve that stops that trauma from happening. So it's really about screening for, um, in order to detect any kind of downward negative spiral as a result of that traumatic experience than for the traumatic experience itself. So I strongly suggest not um, screening for like for um, ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences or any variation of that. It's screening for the, the post-trauma response that we wanna detect. Um, the other part of this consideration is who's gonna complete the screener and who, um, when will those um, students be screened? So you've identified your objectives, what areas you wanna think about, um, who's going to complete it? Um, so most often teachers are who completes the screeners and who's um, what of the, of the screeners that avail are available. Um, they're most often for teachers, but I've also seen some districts do a great job with parents. Um, one district we work with, um, you know, you send home that packet at the beginning of the year of all the forms the parents have to complete. They put it in there as a paper copy. Now it does mean that when it comes back, it has to be entered. They've got it on like a Scantron kind of form so they can scan them all in and get the data entered that way. Um, but it gets a parent perspective and they do it in sixth grade only so that um, they've got data on their incoming middle school students about um, from the parents and from those stakeholders and can match them to, I mean, that's like at the beginning of the year being able to identify students who are gonna need extra support. And I thought that was just a fan, especially as a parent who's used to like dedicating a couple nights to those forms, right? Like I thought that was a pretty fantastic idea. Um, and I've got other districts that, especially starting in like fourth grade um, through middle school that have students doing their own self-report. Um, and I think I really appreciate them being able to get student voice into that. Um, another question you have to answer is when. Um, there's a range and honestly, the empirical research isn't very clear. Um, people keep saying three times a year, but there isn't really great empirical research to suggest to, um, back that up twice a year to me seems like a better approach. Um, honestly, about 80% of your students are not gonna change from fall to spring. Um, so, um, so it's you know very minuscule of those that will change. And that spring screen gives you kind of a post-test. So you really can evaluate your tier one on a population tier one kind of level. You can evaluate that if you have that spring 
um, end of year screen and fall can be used to match the intervention need. Um, I've also, if we get there, we're running further on time than I realized. <laughs> um, I've also had a district here in Florida that um, they use a screener where the cutoff for significance is that six, the, a standard score is 60. It's a version of the BASC. Um, and they, so they screen everybody in the fall. And then in the spring, they screen everybody that scored a 50 or above on the fall screener, they get screened in the spring. So it's just a subsample and they move it a little bit below the cutoff, right? So they're getting those kids that are kind of borderline at that risk level. Um, and they're just, they just rescreen them and they do it very early in the spring. So there's still time for intervention. Um, but by just doing that subsample, they don't, they are not able to use their data um, to evaluate tier one because they don't have the entire school. So they're not able to evaluate the effectiveness of their tier one at a population level. But that was a choice that they made. They felt like um, that, that, that tier one monitoring tier one effectiveness was um, not worth the extra resources of screening everybody in the school in the spring. And so that's where you have to decide like what resources you have and, and be able to answer these questions and bring in your stakeholders to do that. Um, so that takes for care of the first two parts of the procedural planning chapter. And, and then the third section is establishing data collection, storage and access procedures. So now you've figured out what measure you're gonna use, who's gonna complete it, how often you're gonna do it, for what purposes, right? Now you've gotta figure out how you're gonna collect, store and make sure that um, people can access it. And so some of this is already covered in ethical and legal considerations because again, of those FERPA laws and data access you have to um, pay attention to. But also um, it's really important in school districts I've worked with that their school and districts I've worked with that their schools and their people in their schools have immediate access to that data. If they put in the effort to collect it and to get it, get teachers to put it on there, then that principal wants to be able to look at it right away. The school counselor who's helping collect it or the psychologist, like they wanna be able to start working with it. And if you have a two week delay um, or a three day delay or a four day delay, then you start losing momentum. And now you've likely collected data that like might not get really used because it's you know been four days, you've lost momentum and it's gonna be like sitting in their inbox and they aren't gonna get it done. But if they can start looking at it right away, then you can start um, building that momentum. So um, accessible really easily and very quickly is important. Um, and I've seen that happen often in districts where momentum was lost because they took too long to get the data back to them. Um, you also wanna make sure that you're working with a system that has multiple views. So we, again, we think about it, um, another district I have, they gave it back to their building. They only paid for like a minimum level of this um, screener. So they were able to download each school as an Excel spreadsheet and then they had to do all this manipulation. And um, um, so they had to rely on the school counselors having really strong Excel skills to be able to filter through and pull out and look at like trends in each classroom and trends in each grade level. Um, and in each risk level and in each domain that the tool measured. And that just wasn't realistic. Like I have pretty slick Excel skills and find it fun and nerdy to play in Excel and that would drive me crazy. Um, so you really wanna make sure you have a data system where immediately you can click different buttons and it shows you like the trends at those different levels. Um, and that also that um, the really fancy and nice ones are integrated into um, your student information system. So you can easily also not just look at um, the, the score on the screening tool, but also their attendance, their special education status, their discipline, um, academic performance, right? And so you have a, a wide view of the child and how the child is performing in the school. And that you're planning training um, and ongoing technical assistance. Um, Interesting. So people are saying the PDF is white. I can look at that. Sorry. Is that the link um, that you posted, Taylor? Or you copied from my PowerPoint? Yes, I believe so. But um, we can make sure that we've got the appropriate link um, disseminated to everyone following today's presentation so that they have access. Okay. To 
sounds good. My apologies. I don't know if the link um, just copied funny or something. Um, if anybody ha can find the link, I, I, you can put it in there. I'll try to maybe multitask here. Um, it's also important that you plan training and ongoing technical assistance. I'm sure you probably all know this, but not everybody's super comfortable with data um, or Excel or um, other you know, platforms. Um, and so making sure that you're providing that technical assistance, what I've seen um, a de a de one of the districts I talked about earlier do is really they, um, they had identified a few people that were really good with Excel skills. And so when the screening was done, those people blocked off the next week and they just went from like all the schools, this was pre COVID, you know, when we could visit all the schools, <laughs> and, and they went and, you know, had meetings with all the principals and like, provided job embedded training and coaching and going through the data. And so that they identified before they went to that team meeting, they had the trends at the school level identified, they had classroom trends identified, they had grade level trends, they had an agenda for their team meeting. Um, versus um, I had a project again, um, pre-COVID and um, what I was going to team meetings and observing to see what their discussion of the screening results was like and had several teams that spent the entire team trying to figure out how to download the Excel spreadsheet from the software system um, and how to get it up and running. And then an hour after that, everybody had other places to go. So making sure um, it seems just so intuitive, like, well, we'll give them the spreadsheet and they'll go and do that. But um, that's not how everybody works. So making sure that they have that technical assistance and coaching um, to be prepared is, is again, the only way that um, we make sure that the screening actually does lead to the outcomes we intend. How we implement it um, matters in this situation. Um, one example, I do want to say um, before I jump to the next slide too, that I actually have no money in any of the screening tools. Um, so I'm open to a district using any tool <laughs> that they, after they've identified their objectives and domains and purpose for screening, um, anything that's psychometrically valid, I support, I get no, I have, I am not interested in developing a measure um, or getting money off of it. I'm really interested in helping schools use them to, to help their children and get um, students and kiddos the uh, interventions that they need. So the examples I give are just examples of districts I've worked with, not because I come with any sort of conflict of interest. Okay, um, the BIMAS, some people call it the BIMAS, so you can pick, <laughs> but the Behavior Intervention Monitoring Assessment System is one of the kind of like mid-range cost tools um, that has a software system and they talk to um, different student information systems, depending on what you have. Um, they have a setup to talk to them. And what I like is that they have it easily accessible to where you can um, break it down and look at the trends. This is by um, middle school. These are by schools right here, but there's views that, um, that look at it at the entire district and then at different school levels. So you can look at all elementary to gather all middle school together all high school together, you can look at it um, um, uh, at grade levels um, or at the class level. Um, it, it has all these different ones. So Boston Public Schools uses the BIMAS, Duval County, which is Jacksonville here in Florida. I work with them quite a bit. Um, they use the BIMAS. Um, and it, I really like the just multiple views that it gives you. And then it also breaks it down at that student level, which is, you know, again, I know that's what most people are using um, it for, um, but it easily identifies students who scored at the highest level and middle level of yellow and then green. And you can click on the student to get an individual report of their information. Um, I'm seeing the time. And so if people have questions, I can um, stop and answer them, but I, I'll also keep going. I knew I was gonna run long, but um, yeah. So I can stop and answer questions or I'll just keep going until I see a question in the um, chat box. Um, this is an example from a, the district I mentioned here in Florida that does like the subsample screen in the spring. Um, they do the full school in the fall and just those like 50 and above in the spring. And they, um, because they're the ones that also did that like minimum level they purchased at like the most basic level of their screening tool. Um, and so they had to figure out with their own, they had some tech savvy people who figured out how to download the data 
and then um, merge it with their student information system data um, and, and color code it. Um, but they basically, they're the ones that I said they have to like to create this Excel spreadsheet that they give um, to their um, to their school teams, they have to like block out um, their tech people's like a full week for them. So the data gets entered, they spend a week creating everybody's, every school's spreadsheet and, and validating and double checking it, right? Because once you start manipulating those spreadsheets, errors can happen. So they have to do a lot of um, valid data validity checks. And then they send them to the schools and an attachment. And they're the, also the ones where like um, in the meetings that took the school counselor like an hour to figure out how to download it, get it saved and start start going around with it. So because, um, because yes, they're entering it online, but because it's in Excel, they're also requiring um, the schools to identify their own trends. Like they're having to, you know, filter it to all, look at all of the fourth grade and see trends there and look at all of the third grade or um, Mrs. Splitt's um, or, you know, Mrs. Greenlaw's classroom they're having to do all of those filters whereas the one i showed you before like you can immediate you can just click on stuff to see those trends um and so again they maybe didn't pay as much but they're going to spend the extra the resources on their personnel time um the final piece is establishing a protocol for using the results. So you've got their data, they've collected the data, you've got it back to them. They need a protocol for using it so that um, it gets used. And so that students are matched to intervention resources and that we have the resources, um, the programming um, set up to meet the students' needs that we're going to identify. Um, and this quote always comes to mind um, for me when I talk about establishing a protocol is because um, the only way students get to intervention is because we've set and systematized that process um, from the beginning. So someone is sitting in the shade, someone is getting intervention because somebody else planned that previously. Um, and so here's some steps to plan it. Um, and uh, establishing, this is really goes into like what meeting foundations, your team membership, your um, meeting foundations, and then the team having a database decision-making protocol. Um, and so um, oftentimes teams and schools and processes look like this. We, we're doing a whole bunch of things and they're just like going everywhere and nobody knows where they're going. They're just going, right? You're just doing and acting and going places. And so really um, the procedures and that planning guide are meant to help you look a little bit more like this so that you have a, a structure for teaming, processes for that teaming, and procedures in place to do so. Um, just really quickly, um, I think when people adopt screening, I have one district that um, developed a whole team just for screening. When in reality, there's probably a team already existing that that responsibility could have been um, weaved into their, their responsibility and their task list. So I think before you go out and create a new team for every initiative, including screening, like map your teams, see what teams are happening in your school buildings and at the district level, um, what their responsibilities are, where there's overlap and you can combine, um, and what new kind of things you need to create. But oftentimes there's already um, one happening. This is kind of what we use to talk about a teaming structure for multi-tiered mental health systems. Um, and oftentimes the screening can sit, fit into that um, leadership team and uh, that supplemental intervention team. Membership, um, sorry, we're running a little bit out of time, but teaming structures matter a lot, like the purpose and objective um, to do that. We talked about that a little bit. Processes are, um, you know, the, the process that unfolds during the team meeting. Um, I don't know if anybody likes Hangover. It's one of my favorite movies, <laughs> telling you probably too much about myself, but I saw this graphic and, and really loved it. If you know the movie that you might um, identify it with it too, or have been on a team where these personalities um, have shown through. Um, I'm, um, these kind of define what structure processes and procedures are. Um, Taylor, do we need to end in like two minutes? One minute? You are more that we've, I've got 4.53 on my clock. So you keep on rocking and rolling. This is fantastic. And I love the hangover too. That's very funny. Yeah. I knew you said you had a post webinar survey. So you'll just put that up and I'll keep talking. Okay. I can do that. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> All right, so teaming structures, processes. The processes are, you know, the roles and responsibilities and the rules of like, we're gonna start and end on time, or everybody's gonna attend, we're gonna take minutes, we're gonna be accountable to follow through. Like when we take minutes and create an action plan, everybody's gonna be accountable to act on that between the meetings and we're gonna follow up with it the next meeting. I'm sure you've been part of those meetings where it's like every meeting we kind of regurgitate the exact same thing that just happened um, because nobody's taking minutes or creating accountability for those next steps to be, um, for people to follow through with them. And there, if people get the sense that there's no accountability, then they're, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> I've got plenty of other things I can go, go fill my time with. And then the procedures are, that they're using data-based um, problem solving and they have a intervention selection protocol to match. So that intervention selection protocol is really based on um, looking at what your array of interventions that a school has access to. What resources do they have? Um, what needs do your students have? And so you can use that for a gap analysis. You can use that to say like, here's the um, interventions we're missing um, and to set up a protocol. So. I often, um, this is a protocol one of my districts um, set up and, and just some examples of it, but they mapped out all the interventions they had in their district and they put them into a protocol. They listed them here, whether they're tier two or three, what grade level they are. And then each intervention listed, if, if, if you clicked on it in the PDF, it took you to a page that gave everybody more information about it. And they trained on those. And, and in the protocol, it says like, who in the building, the school employed or school-based mental health staff is, is trained to provide this intervention. Um, and so the, they trained their teams on using this protocol and it just made that, that database decision-making process very automatic. There wasn't this kind of like problem admiration thing happening. It was just like, once they got trained on the protocol and they got used to using it, they could very quickly be like, okay, match, Let's um, try match. Here's the progress monitoring strategy we're going to use um, and who's going to do it. We'll find a time um, and it becomes a lot more automatic in those meetings. Um, and so to do that protocol, you have to know what interventions you have and what interventions you need. And so this is an example of a resource mapping that you could use um, to do that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention finally, or we're getting close to finally, I should say, um, but you can use other data sources to figure out what interventions your students might need that you don't already have. So you already have these. Um, and here's, you can look at um, school climate and risk surveys that you're probably already doing, your discipline data, community data, um, referrals to community providers like our um, self-harm referrals, changing or have other referrals changed at all lately and calls to crisis centers. Um, I strongly encourage districts and I have several that have done this that in their first year or two are screening, they just adopted it as population surveillance. So they're just monitoring um, tier one needs and using it um, to identify what intervention needs their population is going to need once they start using screening to connect to intervention. Um, so when they set that objective out, then that that's an okay thing to do. And they can make sure that when they do start screening to identify intervention need, they have the capacity to act because they built that capacity. Um, one example of doing that, we did a study um, with one of my districts. We took like, we asked them who they were already serving with mental health supports and then took their screening data and were able to identify um, students that were previously identified by the district, students newly identified by the screener. So those were students that um, the district wasn't meaning um, providing mental health supports to, but the screener, they were at cutoff on the screener. Um, students that the school was providing supports to, but the screener didn't identify, and students that neither one of them identified. And the cool thing about this data is that when you look at um, discipline referrals and grades and absences and their screening scores, and you line it up like from most severe to least, it, these are all going down. And so you can see that the newly identified students had r less risk than the previously identified students. And in a really fun nerdy way, it like maps right on to a triangle. So those newly identified students are really those tier two students. And that's often where schools um, struggle with the most supports. Like they struggle um, implementing tier two. There's a lot of rules and regulations around mental health supports and we have clinicians for those tier three needs. 
Um, and we have our teachers for our tier one, but we have a lot of gaps at that tier two level. And that's where most of the newly identified students are. Um, and, and so some of those we're gonna do follow-up assessments and, and checking with, and they're not gonna actually need mental health supports. They just maybe need a stronger relationship with their teacher or check in with the parent. Um, and others might need a little bit more, um, but we're able to um, sort through those now that we have the data. Um, looking at the time. So um, I'll go back and the end on this screen. I think the one way that one of our districts kind of solved that tier two problem is they used check in, check out as an early access. So every student newly identified by their screener um, was put into check in, check out. They trained everybody they possibly could in check in, check out, made it a systemized process, put people in there. And after a couple of weeks in check in, check out, we're able to quickly figure out who needed additional and enhanced tier two intervention and who, who needed to just continue on check and check out and who didn't need it at all and could go back to tier one. And so it provided that early access hands-on um, and, and kind of a triaging system. All right. That is all I got for today. I think we're out of time. I was gonna put my, um, if you have any questions, it looks like people were actually able to um, go and find the, the implementation guide. I'm excited about that. Um, but if you weren't, email me and I can get it to you. You can call me sitting in my office now. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions and love working with district and community people. So let me know. Daughters Club, this is fantastic. <laughs> huge resource. Everyone seems really excited about the additional resources. And just to reiterate, we are happy to, you know, be the connector there to make sure um, that we get you all those PDFs. It looks like that PDF um, link was functional. Um, and so that was exciting to hear um, this webinar, as well as all of our webinars, including Dr. Lane. Um, August webinar that Dr. Splett mentioned earlier are available on the School Behavioral Health website. I did put that link into the chat as well. Hopefully y'all are familiar with our website and have enjoyed playing with all the new resources that the Behavioral Alliance South Carolina has created. If you ever wanna connect with us, and we certainly hope that you do, um, you can follow us on all of our social media platforms. We're especially active on Facebook as well as YouTube. That's where we house all of our resources and our content. Um, we would love to see y'all subscribe and connect with us on there so that we can deepen our relationship with everyone. And as Dr. Splett so brilliantly added in today, we are going with um, our open registration for our 2021 hybrid conference, um, which is going to be in April of this year. Um, so we do have the virtual attendee option. Um, and I can tell you all that our, our speakers, our keynotes, and just the entire content of this conference is absolutely incredible. We would love to see you there. And if you are up for coming live, we also have that option as well. Um, we are following all CDC guidelines to make sure to uplift our health standards and keep everyone safe and secure while we are continuing our education and having the opportunity to uh, support our kids and our communities uh, throughout South Carolina as well as our whole region. Um, so with all of that being said, thank you so much, Dr. Splett. This was fantastic. And uh, super, super helpful, and you're super insightful and a fantastic presenter. So it does make <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate you dealing. I tried so hard to cut things down. So I'm sorry for the rushed ending, but it's so fun to be here. It did not feel rushed at all. And we certainly appreciate it. And like I said, right. um, everyone, yeah. if you would like to connect with us um, around resources or um, additional information, you can reach out to us at bask at mailbox.sc.edu or connect with us on any of our social media and website. So with that being said, I will go ahead and say one last uh, thank you, gratitude, Dr. Splett. Look forward to connecting in emails and thank yeah, you for joining in today. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. All right, bye y'all. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye.